Lord, open our eyes, open our minds to receive what, we, what you have for us today in your word. Lord, we are thirsty. And we've been trying to fill our bodies, we've been trying to quench our thirst with all sorts of things this week. God, we've looked to relationships, we've looked to entertainment, we've looked to our success or our failure in our job or in our our classwork in order to bring us that fulfillment. And yet, God, you tell us that you are the fountain of life and that it is only in you that we can come and find true satisfaction. That it's only in you that we can come and find true fulfillment. That you are the only living water that can quench our thirst. And so, Lord, help us to turn away from all of the other wells that run dry. And help us to turn to you, Lord, today. To turn to you, even right now, Lord, to turn our attention and our hearts to you, Lord. That you will speak to us by your word. Speak plainly, Lord. Speak clearly to us, Lord. Give us encouragement. Lord, even as the Philippian church needed to be encouraged, Lord, encourage us in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Now, I want you, this is audience participation, congregation participation. I would like you to say out loud, I need somebody. I, need somebody. I don't believe you. One more time. I need, I need somebody. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to say, you are somebody. And now I want you to look at somebody else and say, you are somebody. And now I want you to look, look up front here and I want you to say, I am somebody. I need somebody. You are somebody. Have you ever thought about that word, somebody? Probably not, right? Right? This is a weird thing that happens when you're, when you're a teacher and, you, and you, you, you focus in on words sometimes. But I want us to take a minute and just think about this word, somebody. All right? Somebody. We just, we just said, I need somebody. Right? I am somebody and you are somebody. But what is a somebody? Well, let's break it down. A somebody. A sum is a certain one. Right? So, something that is some set apart. It's something that is unique. A some body. What's a body? A body is the physical part of you. A body is the part of you that is unique. A body is the part of you that we look at and rejoice that you are made in the image of God. We look, we, the, the body is what we manifest in this world. It's what we live in. And we know that we're not only bodies, right? We're also what? Souls, right? We're also souls or spirits. We're souls or spirits. Those words are used interchangeably in the Bible. We are a body spirit or we are an ensouled body. So say, I am an ensouled body. That's right. I am an ensouled body. But sometimes we forget that we are some body. And, and, and let me tell you, as I've thought about the way that we communicate, think about the way that we communicate actually works against the fact that you are some body. Let me explain what I mean. What's your favorite way to communicate? Text? Is it te- how many of you, your favorite way to communicate is a text message? Just raise your hand. Really? If I'm calling you, you're going to pick up the phone and answer, or are you going to text me back? Tell the truth. Well, you might pick, you you know, if if I was calling. But why do we prefer, okay, so if we're being real, we do like the text. We do like the social media thing. We do like things that are disembodied, things that are not, Physical, things that are not, but when it really comes down to it, what do we really love? And y'all have already said it. What do we really love? What do we really want? We really want that personal, in-person, we want that body-to-body communication, right? We want to be present with one another. Why do we want that? Because you are some body. You are some body. You need some body. And the way we communicate Maybe not the way we prefer, but the way that we often communicate 
completely ignores what? The body. Right? It completely ignores the body. And so we're used to being in this world of, of, uh, uh, of communicating online, of, of propping ourselves up on social media, of, of sending text messages and emails, and, and, and even a handwritten letter is so much closer to a body, isn't it, than a typed message. Now, I'm not really preaching against technology. Technology is wonderful. But the fact is, technology has an effect on us. It has an effect on how we engage with one another. It has an effect on how we think of ourselves. They're talking about creating the metaverse. Or they've already created the metaverse, I guess. Have they, Luke, have they created it already or are they going to create it? They created it and it failed. Okay, well, they're, they're working on it, right? It's going to happen. It's this world where there's no physical presence. Right, where you just sort of exist in this digital landscape. And so what happens when we strip the soul from the body? What happens? You die. You die. Our scripture today is going to remind us that we are not just a soul, that we are not just a spirit, but that we are a soul and a body, and that our physical presence matters, that our physical presence, whether it's in a conversation, right, sitting across the table, whether it's in um, any kind of uh, gathering like this, like your physical presence matters. The fact that you are here today means something, and people who are online are missing out on an aspect of what God has created us for, right, and I'm glad we have the opportunity for that. It's good because it allows maybe more people to join in in, in a way. But, but, but God created you spirit and body. Body and soul. And so he wants us to remember that the body matters. I need some body. I am some body. You are some body. Our scripture uh, begins, we're beginning in verse 19, and so if you'll turn there, uh, we're going to kind of work through this, and we're going to see just exactly what somebody that God is going to give to us, what somebody is God going to send to us. See, the context of this is that the Apostle Paul is writing a letter, right? He's writing a text, let's say. Okay. He's writing a text message, a long text message, to the church at Philippi, and he's communicating God's word. He's communicating the good news of Jesus. He's communicating something written down. And in the chapter, in second chapter in verse 16, it says that we are holding fast to the word of life. And so the written word is important, y'all. It is what gives us the content of the gospel. But there's a turn in verse 19. There's a turn because God is saying to the Philippian church, I'm not only going to send you a word, I'm going to send you some body. Look at verse 19. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says, I hope in the Lord. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests. He's talking about the the false teachers who are influencing the church. They all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. And he says, that's not who I'm sending to you. What, What kind of person is he sending to the Philippian church? He's sending somebody who genuinely loves them. Did you notice? He's sending somebody who genuinely loves them. Look at what it says. It says, so that in verse 20, for I have no one like him who will be what? Genuinely concerned for your welfare. You see, Timothy was with Paul when the church at Philippi was planted. Ten years before, Timothy was there. And then after the church was started, Timothy actually stayed behind and helped get the church going while Paul moved on. And then Timothy went and joined him later. 
And so Timothy was a known quantity in this community. And in fact, they, they knew how much he cared for them. And, and, and it's possible that Timothy uh, was one of, the, one of the people to deliver this letter to the church at Philippi. To deliver the letter in person. We don't know for sure. It could be that Epaphroditus delivered the letter and Timothy came later. Or it could be that they came together. It doesn't say exactly. But the, but the, but the important thing to remember here is that God is sending somebody who genuinely loves them. Who genuinely loves them. He is not a hired gun. Timothy is not a fly-by-night preacher. A Timothy is not somebody who has a job to do. No, Timothy loves this church. Just like Paul loves this church, Timothy loves this church. And they know it because they've already been loved by him, right? They've already experienced his presence in their church back years ago when it first got started. And so do you think they're looking forward to someone who genuinely loves them to come to them? And can you tell the difference when somebody is acting like they love you and someone who actually genuinely loves you? Yeah, you can tell the difference. We can tell when love is not genuine. We can tell when love is not genuine, when when love comes from a place of of selfish ambition or, or love comes from a place of what can you do for me? Right? What can you, how can you, I'll scratch your back if you, what? Scratch mine. See, that's how the world operates. That's how the world operates, but that is not what God is doing. That is not what God is doing with his people, with his somebodies. What God is doing with his somebodies is he's sending them to genuinely love one another. And you know what? God is doing that with you, right? You raised your hand and said, I'm somebody. And God is sending you. God is sending you to genuinely love somebody. He's sending you to be a messenger of of what, someone who is genuinely concerned for the welfare of a group of people. Maybe that's your family. Maybe that's your roommate. Maybe that's people around you at school. Maybe it's people around you uh, in your neighborhood or at work. Maybe it's people who you really are annoyed with, but God has sent you into their life to be genuinely concerned for their welfare. See, he's making application of what he told us at the beginning of chapter 2, that Jesus came unconcerned for his welfare. Jesus came to give his life. And so he's inviting us to do the same, to, to genuinely love one another. And so it's, it's somebody, God is sending somebody who genuinely loves us. The second thing God is sending, the second type of somebody that God is sending is somebody who represents the Father. Look at verse 22. He says, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. You see, the apostle Paul is sending Timothy. And what does he call Timothy? His his son. And the son, Timothy, not not a biological son, but a spiritual son. And he's sending his spiritual son to represent his spiritual father. The spiritual father is sending the spiritual son to represent the spiritual father in this church and in this community. He's sending somebody who represents the father. And he says that Timothy is faithful. He he has proven worth. Right? That means that uh, he has a track record of goodness and kindness and love and the fruit of the Spirit. He has a track record of faithfulness. And so he is sent to represent Paul to the church. He is sent to represent Paul to the church. Paul is his spiritual father. Did you know Paul probably led Timothy to faith on his first missionary journey? He was sitting there with this young uh, Jewish Gentile young man, and he walked him through the gospel. Did you notice what it said? He says that he is a partner. He has served with me in the gospel. And so from the very beginning, Timothy believed, and then Paul pulled him in and said, I want you to come with me and to help help me to serve the nations by bringing this message of, of good news, by bringing this message of hope. And Timothy agrees, and he goes with him. Let me ask you, do you have 
a spiritual father, so to speak, or mother? Do you have a spiritual parent? Do you have someone who is pouring into your life? Someone who is teaching you how to have faith? Someone who's teaching you how to walk with Jesus day by day? Do you have a spiritual father or spiritual mother? Do you have a spiritual son or daughter? Do you have someone that you're pouring into, that you're sharing what God has brought from, into your life with someone else? Do you have a spiritual son or a spiritual daughter? See, God is sending somebody who represents the Father to this church. And God wants to send you into somebody else's life so that you can be a spiritual father or mother to somebody who needs a spiritual father or mother, someone who needs guidance, someone who needs direction. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how old you are because if you're 18, you got people younger than you, right? And if you're 99, well, I don't know if somebody's older than you. But there might be someone who's mature in the faith, who could even lead a 99-year-old. God is sending to the church at Philippi somebody who genuinely loves them. He's sending somebody who represents the spiritual father. And he is sending somebody who is one of them. Look at verse 25. And Paul writes, after he says, I'm going to send Timothy, he says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. So who is Epaphroditus? Epaphroditus is from where? Philippi. Right, and the church at Philippi actually uh, heard that the Apostle Paul had gotten uh, thrown into prison because of the faith. And so they asked Epaphroditus to go to Paul, to go to Rome, and to send with him a care package. And so they put together a nice care package, and they raised some funds to help Paul in his situation and to help advance the cause of the gospel that Paul was, was, had become a missionary. And so they sent that by way of Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus went to deliver this gift, but on the way, somehow, some way, Epaphroditus got sick. You see, traveling uh, across country or internationally today is fairly easy, right? Because we have trains and comfortable aircraft and uh, comfortable ways of travel. But in those days, it was dangerous to travel. They had to face, uh, they had to face the, uh, the outdoors. They had to face uh, the hardships of travel. They had to face possibly being robbed and beaten. And so Epaphroditus traveled and he he uh, went to Paul, and at this point, Paul is saying, because he got, he got better, he said, I'm going to send you back. And so Paul is sending Epaphroditus back home. He's sending them somebody who is one of them. He's sending somebody who is one of them. Imagine someone who hasn't been to church in a while. And they come back on a Sunday morning. What do we do? It's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. It's still like there's this reunion, right? And so what, what Paul is doing is he's sending Epaphroditus back for a reunion because he's one of them. God sends somebody who is one of them. He's a Philippian. God is sending you and me to people who are one of us. God is sending you and me, like Epaphroditus, to people who are one of us. Think about it. You naturally gravitate toward people who are like you. Right? I do too. We naturally gravitate toward people who are like us. Laurie and I and the kids like to, I don't know if the kids do, but I think we all do. We like to watch Survivor. Okay? And we, y'all know what Survivor is. Survivor is a TV show, a reality TV. It's been on for 22 years, I think. And we've been watching it for 22 years. Okay? <laughs> we started watching it when we were dating. Um, and still watch it today. And one of the interesting things about uh, Survivor, or really any reality TV show, is they bring people from different backgrounds together into one tight space. And it's sort of like a social experiment. Anybody sociology major or interested in that? Okay, Joel. And so, so you know, they're putting people together in this 
social experiment. And what's, what always happens in the TV show is that people who are like each other tend to gravitate together. So if there's women, they tend to gravi- gravitate together. If there's a group of macho men, they sort of gravitate together. If there's um, an older crowd, they sort of gravitate together. And it's even like uh, ethnically, you know, if there's a group of uh, black people, they'll gravitate together. If there's uh, a couple of Asians, they'll gravitate together. And it's just what we do, right? We, we do this. This is part of how God, I think, um, gi- gives us an opportunity. Because you don't have to explain yourself when you're from Philippi. Right? You don't have to explain yourself if you're black. You don't have to explain yourself if you're more experienced. Right? You don't have to explain yourself if you're an engineer to other engineers. You just get each other. Right? If you're a teacher, you, you just get each other. Y'all, y'all see where I'm going? And so, and so what God is doing is he sends somebody who is one of us, and he's sending you to somebody who is one of you. Now, when we gather in the church, we come from all different backgrounds, right? But when we go into our mission, God has placed you in specific places and specific relationships where he wants you to use your shared experience to to reach people for Christ. And it might be your neighbors, it might be your peers, it might be uh, people that you work with, it might be any of these categories that we've talked about. And these are things that divide us as a world, right? But in the kingdom, they become opportunities. They become opportunities to love and to bring the truth, the truth about the gospel to people who are like us. Because we don't have to spend time explaining our differences, we can just get right to the point. I'm a sinner, I fall short of God's glory. But God God sent a Savior who gave me his love and has given me new life in him and forgiveness of my sins. Like, you can just get right to it. That's the beauty of a multi-ethnic church, right? Is because we can reach all kinds of people. But I'm not going to be very effective going uh, into the barbershop and trying to reach people in the barbershop. I can try, but I'm not going to be as effective as maybe Joel would be, right? Or maybe as uh, effective as Michael might be. Going into those spaces. Y'all hear me? Do you hear God's word? He's sending someone who is one of them. And he's sending you, somebody, who is one of them. Into the places in life where you can be effective to share the good news of Jesus. God is sending somebody who genuinely loves us. Timothy. He's sending somebody who represents our spiritual father, Timothy. He's sending somebody who is one of us, Epaphroditus. And lastly, he's sending somebody who gave his life for us. Look at verse 27. Paul writes of Epaphroditus and he says, Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow being in jail upon sorrow, Epaphroditus dying. In verse 28, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. In other words, to do what you sent him out to do. God has sent somebody who risked his life for them. God is sending somebody back to uh, Philippi who risked, who gave his life for them. Do y'all see that? Epaphroditus nearly died on this mission. He nearly nearly died traveling to minister to Paul. He risked his life for the work of Christ. Christ. What is God calling you to risk? What is God calling you to risk? What is God calling you to give up for someone else? Is God calling you to move toward people? What will it take? What will it take to move towards someone? What will it take to share the gospel, to actually have that conversation? What will it take to to serve and love? It'll take time. 
it'll take resources, it'll take energy, it'll take money, it'll take freedom. It'll, it, it might even take your life if you get into some situations that are risky like Epaphroditus did. What are we re- willing to risk to bring the hope of Christ to this broken world? What are we willing to risk? And then what do we receive when God sends somebody into our life who was willing to risk it all so that we could be saved? What are we going to What are we going to get when we realize that God has sent somebody to to pour his life out so that we could be saved? And I want you to think about who has done that in your life? Who has poured it all out? Who has given their life for you? And I'm not talking about Jesus, not yet. All right, I'm I'm still talking about, I know y'all like Jesus, right? But no, I'm talking about people in your life who have gotten uncomfortable so that you can know Jesus. People in your life who have risked uh, being embarrassed. People in your life who have risked uh, being called foolish, who have given up uh, time and energy so that you could know Christ. I think if we think about it, we, we could easily think of a few people, right? Somebody. Somebody who gave his life or her life for us. God gave us the word of life. And he gave us his people, somebody who embodies the good news, who brings it to us, somebody who genuinely loves us like Timothy, somebody who represents the Father like Timothy, somebody who is one of us like Epaphroditus, somebody who gave his life for us like Epaphroditus like you and me. But I hope you figured it out already. (laughs) These examples are not what this is ultimately really about, are they? These examples of Timothy and of Epaphroditus are really about somebody else. They're really about somebody else. They're really about Jesus. Because Jesus is somebody who genuinely loves us. Who went to the depths, to the dark places of humanity, into the recesses of our twisted imaginations and minds. He goes there and he says, I love you unconditionally. I love you and I love you so much that I'm willing to give my life for you. Someone who genuinely loves us. Someone who comes to us representing the Father. right? Someone who comes to us and and, and Jesus says, I am. When When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. In the unity of the triune God, you see the Father. You see somebody who represents the Father. And you see somebody who is one of us. Jesus is one of us. He's from Philippi, y'all. We don't have to explain things to him. He just gets it. Because he came in the flesh and he lived in our humanity and he lived under all of the temptations that we have. He lived under all the hard things, the broken families, the broken relationships, the rejection, all of the pain of life, including the pain all the way to the point of death on the cross. Jesus is somebody who is one of us that God has sent to us. And Jesus is somebody, of course, who gave his life for us. He's somebody who risked it all, all the way to the cross. He took the penalty that our sins deserved. He took it upon himself. And now he offers his life, his eternal life, as a free gift for every one of us who will believe. And every one of us outside of these walls who will believe. He's somebody who genuinely loves us. Somebody who is representing the Father, someone who is one of us and somebody who gave his life for us. As we go back through the passage, there's three phrases that jump out to me. In verse 19, where Paul says, hope in the Lord. In verse 24, he says, trust in the Lord. And in verse 29, he says, receive him in the Lord. And so the question that I have for us today is how do we 
How do we receive Jesus? How do we receive him today? I want to end just by telling you a story. I want you to imagine that you're out sailing in a ship and you're, you're out to sea. And you've hit a storm. And you're pretty good at sailing, but you're not that good. And so the storm tosses the ship and you end up far off course and your instruments are not working and you have no idea where you are and the storm keeps beating down on the ship and keeps beating down to the point that the waves are crashing over crashing over into the boat and the, the boat is rocking back and forth and suddenly the, the boat tips and begins to break apart. The storm is so bad and you're by yourself and, and, you're, and I want you to imagine that as the ship is breaking apart, you're looking around and you're looking for anything that you can to grab hold of and you find a piece of wood that's just drifting by and you grab hold of it and you're holding on to it for dear life. You're holding on to this piece of driftwood for dear life and you know you're going to die. You know there's no way that you can swim back anywhere to safety. You don't have a way to call for help. You're stuck and you're holding onto this piece of driftwood. You got it? After an hour, you hear something in the fog, a deep, resounding blast of a horn. And as you're freezing and gasping for air, you notice that there's a Coast Guard ship and it's coming up behind you. And from the deck of the Coast Guard ship, uh, the captain um, throws a rope overboard and it lands nearby. It's a, it's a raft attached to the rope, attached to the ship, and you're holding on for dear life. And this thing that's going to save you. And he says, grab hold of the raft. Grab hold of the raft. And at that point, you have a choice to make. Right? You can keep holding on to what is keeping you afloat and has been keeping you afloat fairly well for the last hour, or you can let go of that piece of driftwood and grab hold of the life preserver and hold on to this thing that will carry you back to safety. Y'all, that is a picture of what Christ offers to each one of us, that he has sent somebody. We were were wrecked in our lives. We were wrecked in our sin. We were, um, we, we we make a shipwreck of our lives because of our sin. Right? And maybe you're like, oh, my life's not that bad. Compared to God's goodness, compared to God's standard, we all fall short. We all fall short of his glory. And yet God doesn't leave us drowning in the ocean. He sends us a rescuer. He sends somebody who genuinely loves us. He sends somebody who represents the Father. He sends somebody who is one of us. And he sends somebody who gave his life for us. And what we have to do is receive him. And that means letting go of the things that we're trusting to make us okay. We have to let go of the things that we're trusting to make us right with God. Maybe that's our obedience. It's our sense of morality. It's our sense of what we do, the good things that we do, that we are holding on to. God, I hope God will accept me. And God says, no, you got to let go of that. And you got to reach out and grab hold of this life preserver whose name is Jesus. And he will bring you to safety. That's what faith is. It's, it's letting go of what you're trusting and trusting the one who will rescue you and who will bring you into his eternal kingdom. So receive the Lord with joy. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, thank you for this invitation to let go of what it is that we're holding on to, to let go of the things that we're trusting, the things that we think give us meaning in life, the things that we think um, help us to help us to, to be okay, and to let go of those things and to, and to really totally throw our lives on Jesus knowing that it's not even our grasp of him that keeps us, it's his grasp of us that keeps us. Lord, thank you for sending somebody to the Philippian church. Lord, thank you for sending not just uh, a word, yes, a word, but also a person. Two people, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Lord, thank you that you've sent each of us into this community, that you've sent us into the places where you've called us to be in our lives. And Lord, I pray that, that as we realize that the, the real somebody is Jesus that we need, 
to hold on to. The real person that you've sent to us is Jesus, that as we trust in him, Lord, you would empower us, you would strengthen us, you would give us a courage and a willingness to go out into the world to be somebody in somebody's life. Lord, help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.